and they like the music because it fucking sounds good and they could vibe to it and it felt good listening to it. Kind of like when I listen to reggae, it makes me, it brings like this positive energy over me, bro, to where it, it just relaxes me and I'm just chilling. Hey. This the podcast, podcast, with a prodigy. This the podcast, podcast, with a prodigy. This the podcast, podcast, with a prodigy. Hey. Podcast. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Today, we got another special guest going by the name of Mr. Shadow. How you doing, man? What up, man? Just blessed to be here. Thank you for having me. No problems. Blessed to have you on my podcast. Oh, Where are you man. coming from? San Diego, bro. San Diego. San Diego, California. How was that drive over here today? It wasn't that bad, you know? I mean, you get the usual traffic right there in Dos Lagos, but besides that, yeah. it was pretty smooth. Yeah. So you're uh, um, from San Diego, and you started rapping how long ago? How old were you? Uh, okay, well, I was 15 when I wrote my first project, 16 when it came out, and I'm 42 now, so I don't know, whatever amount of years that is. <laughs> <laughs> Enough years. Yeah, you don't got to count them. like 25, 26 years. Yeah, yeah, that's sick, that's sick. So what area of San Diego are you from? Born and raised in Little Italy, the west side of San Diego. And, um, yeah, man, I mean, unfortunately, the hospital I was born at is not there anymore. They tore it down. The Navy tore it down and used it for something they were doing. But, yeah, that's where I was born and raised at, in Little Italy on the west side. Little Italy. Yeah. Is there anything uh, from Little Italy that, like, stands out to you that you always remember your city for? Well, the bomb food. It's always had that authentic Italian food. You know, it, it was always a Mexican and Italian community before they pushed everybody out and made it a – million dollar condos and whatnot. Now you go down there, the only thing left is my elementary school and and the, the neighborhood park. Everything else pretty much got torn down and and uh they, they built sky rises and and uh, big old lofts and million dollar condos, you know. Yeah. But yeah. Oh when Night Owl's house is still there. His his original house that he <laughs> that he lived in is actually still there. But everything else got torn down and, and turned into some kind of business or you know, luxury condo. Yeah, how, how do you feel about that? It sucked. It sucked, man, because I saw it coming, you know, as I was growing up, you, you know, you started to hear about, you know, they're going to restore the waterfront and it just kept kept moving east, 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 east until they got to the hood. And then before you knew it, we were all out of there and, you know, living became too expensive there. So we had to go a little bit more east to southeast to, to live, you know, to where we could afford something and. And then we go back down there, and now it's all luxury. You know, you see Maseratis and Lamborghinis and shit parked on the streets. Like, it never used to be like that, but hey, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, what's up with uh, Amici Park? Amici Park. Tell me a little bit about Amici Park. Amici Park is the neighborhood park, which actually took over a, a company that was there. Uh, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, it was called Chef Filed Platers, where they used to chrome stuff. And in the back... Um, there was a, a, a rec center, which was Bayside and, um, all that's gone now. And it got replaced with Amici Park where, where the, the older Italian cats play, um, bocce ball now. And, and, uh, there's a dog park now, which never used to be there, but you know, we, we embraced it because basically Bayside and that little cul-de-sac in the back. Is where we used to kick it, where all the homies would park their cars and drink their beers, and we would smoke our weed or whatever, and it all that got taken away. So now they put in the park, and um, kind of messed up though because they wouldn't let us kick it at the park. Gang detail would will come and chase us out of there, but uh. <laughs> you know. But I mean, it's 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 a cool little corner. It's a cool little corner in the neighborhood where I I actually took the uh, my album cover picture for my first album till I die. That's what I that's where I took it. And that was in 96, 97. And, um, you know, just wanted people to know that I'm, I was still from the neighborhood and I was going to add a piece of, of history, a landmark for my neighborhood in, in my album cover, which I did. And now the world knows it, you know, so. Yeah. That was cool. Got to represent. Yeah, always. So were you a part of any gang or clique in San Diego? Yeah, Wop Town. Same clique as my boy Night Owl. You know, my big bro Night Owl. Shout out to him. WAP Town, and um, basically what WAP stands for is without papers, and that term was used for the Italians, you know what I'm saying? But since we were in it, and it was Mexican and Italian families, they come up, with, they came up with WAP Town, and 
that was the gang, the neighborhood that, that was down there and still is. You know, there's a few scattered homies out there. But, I mean, not like it used to be. You know, we, we used to be deep down there to where gang detail would see us on the street and pull us over and harass us and, you know, just try to get us in trouble for no reason. But, yeah, that's 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 where I'm from. Yeah, so WAP Town was kind of just like a conglomeration of all, the, like, the Hispanic and um, Italians. Italians. Yeah. That's sick. Yeah. Uh, I heard you were brought in by a well-known and respected rapper. My boy Night Owl. Night Owl. Yeah, Night Owl, you know. And, it, you know, it's there's there's crazy boys and crazies. I You know, I, I came to the crazies, and uh, which are the older cats. I was always the youngest one around, you know, the homies. And um, it actually benefited me because it turned me into a man hanging around all of them, you know, I couldn't be as as a as a as immature as as the the younger cats would, you know. I would have to you know, know how to act around them. Yeah. Uh little just like side note thing, maybe for like the people listening, can you explain like the relation between um like like young cats and the big homies and how they are like related and stuff like that? Well, I mean, the relation is that you know, you, you look up to them, you respect them. They're like your older brothers. So you got to give them that respect. You know, know what lines not to cross, what what toes not to step on, not to step on any toes, and you know, just be respectful. And they teach you, you know, about respect. And I, again, you know, uh, my my brothers, they they weren't into gang banging, so I would look up to my homeboys from my neighborhood like my brothers. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it was it was cool though. You know, it's cool to have that relationship with your homeboys and have the respect, be mutual, and not just look at you like, ah, you know, this little punk. Nah, you know, it was it was respectful at all times, and I appreciate that because it turned me into the man I am now, you know. Yeah. Was there any times that, like, you accidentally, like, stepped over the line with the big homies or anything like that? No, nah, no. Nah, I, I always knew my place, and I always stayed in it uh, as far as um, just, like, you know, I, I could have reached out to my older homeboy, Night Owl, when I was doing my music or when I started to, and I could have been like, hey, what's up, dog? Put me on, you know? But I felt like I I could have I could have I don't know if I maybe would have stalled his career if he would have came and tried to focus on me a little bit. So I just went about him, you know, with my older home with him, man, which is actually Night Owl's uncle, and um, I just went went at it by myself, and uh, yeah, man, we just I just did it on my own. Again, I could have reached out to Night Owl. He probably would have been like, yeah, you know. But I just decided to do it on my own so I wouldn't cross that line. Mm -hmm. How long was uh, Night Owl a part of that clique before, like, you uh, were a part oh, of it, too? Oh, man. Well, he's he's old, He's old. much older than me. So he was probably, when when I started coming around the home, was I was five, six years old. Seven, you know, I was riding my skateboard, sneaking out my house, you know, and going with the homies. And my mom would come and grab me by the ear, take me back to the house, you know, and night I'll be like, hey, he's okay, you know, he's he's with us. And of course, I mean, what mom's going to let her little six, seven, you know, five, six, seven-year-old hang out with a bunch of grown-ass men <laughs> that are drinking and smoking weed, <laughs> you know, all gangsters too. So um, it, it never, it never, um, it was never a, the right thing to do, but I mean, that's just how I grew up, you know, and, and uh, but he, he was in it, I want to say, Late seventies, early eighties. I was born in seventy nine, so they were already gang banging and doing their thing way before I was even considered, you know, part of that. So yeah, so they were already like a well respected in the in the game. Yeah, yeah, they were they were already doing their thing, and and you know they were full fledged gang bangers, and you know it's it's just crazy, man, that the way it turned out. But yeah, he's he's a, he's a little bit older than me, so he was doing it a few years more than I have. Yeah, sick. There's a lot of big names that have come out of San Diego, um, even now coming out uh, nowadays. But I want to know who are like some names that uh, stand out to you and like why they uh, come to your mind when you think of rappers coming out of San Diego. Well, I mean, there's there's only a handful of us that actually made the noise that we made for the city worldwide on on a worldwide wide scale. Like you know, I was the first one to take. San Diego out of the country. I, w I went to Japan. I was going to Mexico and, you know, do, doing these tours. Um, but, you know, of course, Little One, Night Owl, Little Rob, Jail Felony, which uh, is um, signed to exhibit now. He's signed to open bar. 
uh, Mitchie Slick. And there's also, you know, my boy GPA, which he never got the light that he, he deserves, but he's also really reserved. He's not really about fame or making music, but he's a super talented cat. He's in a lot of my music. But there's so many other cats that we worked with that were so talented that never got the shine they deserved. You know, some of them got killed. Some of them might be locked up. Some of them just decided to get a job. But San Diego's always been the hub for a special type of rap that came out of San Diego with the special type of sound that we brought with Steve Vicious. Shout out to Steve Vicious. He's one of the dopest producers in San Diego, still doing it to this day. Um, the sound that me, Little One Night Owl, and Little Rob brought with Vicious is legendary. I mean... We started a trend to where after after we did it, L.A. jumped on the wagon and everywhere else, you know what I'm saying? So uh, props to all my guys, you know, from San Diego that, that put on for the city because we were really, really a, a force to be reckoned with, bro. Like the sound we were bringing, nobody can match it. We were the first ones to come out with that tongue twist flow with that. We were the first ones to remake old school beats like um, – when I came out, Till I Die, one of my biggest songs is a mixture of, of More Bounce to the Ounce and Atomic Dog. And uh, Steve Vicious made that, you know. We were mixing up uh, One Way, the Bart K's, and just old school old school groups that nobody even thought about doing. And if they did it, they just grabbed the, sound, the, the, the record and sampled it and just sampled four bars and looped it, you know. Like, we would actually take it and replay it and make it ours. So... Yeah. That's something that stood out from San Diego. Yeah, and you said you were, uh, like, the first to take uh, the San Diego music outside of uh, the, you know, the state and the country and stuff yeah. like that. How was that? How did that feel for you? Like, was it, like, a weight on your shoulders? How, how was it for you? Well, it was crazy because to go to another country, I mean, everybody's been out of state. Everybody's been to New Mexico, Arizona, you know, all the, the whole states. But when you go out of the country and you have people that don't speak the language, neither English or Spanish, and you have a sold out show and they're 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 singing your song word for word, but when you meet them they're like, ah, you know, they don't know what to say and shit. That's crazy. <laughs> to me, that's mind boggling, bro. It's crazy because I can't fathom how they, they can but I actually I, I do understand that because I listen to nothing but reggae, right? Mm-hmm. And Mexican music. I don't even listen to rap. So when I listen to reggae, there's 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 a song by Alpha Blondie, and it's in, it's in Hebrew, and I sing it word for word. I don't know what he's saying, <laughs> but I sing it word for word, and I feel like I'm speaking in Hebrew. You know what I mean? I am yeah. actually because I'm singing it, <laughs> but that's the way they must have felt singing my song. Yeah. They they just were moved so much by it that they embrace it so much that they actually learn the language. Not even knowing the language, if that even makes sense, you know. Yeah. Because when they would come up to me, I would see the people in the front row that were rapping or singing my songs word for word. They come up to me and they they couldn't speak to me, and That's vice crazy. versa. I couldn't talk to them, but yet they could sing my song word for word, Spanish or English. Like what? <laughs> and that's I would approach them, be like, "Oh, how you doing?" Be like, "Oh, ah, she okay. I, all right." <laughs> you know, it's crazy, bro. But it's it's one. It's at the same time, it's a, it's an awesome feeling. To know that your 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 music, your work, uh, touches people in a, in in a way to where they learn it word for word, you know the way you wrote it. So it's kind of appreciation for your work. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and it's cool. It's it's a good feeling, and and it, it felt good to be out there. And there was a, there was times where between shows, you know, I, I would come down to the hotel lobby and I was waiting for my for the you know for the van or whatever that was picking us up to take us to the venue. And I just be sitting there like just quiet, smoking a blunt, thinking to myself, damn, I'm actually out here doing this shit. Like I'm in Japan right now. <laughs> you know, and then it's it's just crazy, bro. And and again, I think the 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 thing that moved me the most is that that they would actually sing it without knowing a lick of Spanish or English. Yeah. How would you tell us how the fans were dressed? Oh, and to this day, I mean they were dressed like straight 
gangsters from San Diego or L.A. <laughs> I'm talking. But see, it's crazy because this is where you get to look at the at the way that we live out here and how it's a culture. And to them, it's a fashion. You would see gangster. I mean, the most gangster. I'm talking size 50 dickies, creased down, <laughs> bandanas. But the bandana would be yellow, green, pink, red, blue. They don't care what color it was because to them it was a fashion statement. To us, it's a way of life. It's a culture. You feel me? To them, they just liked it because it looked cool. And they liked the music because it fucking sounds good and they could vibe to it. And it felt good listening to it. Kind of like when I listen to reggae. It makes me, it brings like this positive energy over me, bro, to where it it just relaxes me. And I'm just chilling, you know? Yeah. And I think to them, that's, 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 that must be the way they feel because... They don't care what. I mean, they were wearing yellow shoelaces, yellow bandana, <laughs> black dickies with a a white crop top. And this is a chick. <laughs> a full Japanese chick, you know? But, again, it's, it's a fashion to them, bro. To them, they're not wearing it because they want to be gangster or because they're from some hood and that's, you know what I mean, they're representing. Nah, to them, it's a, it's a fashion statement. Like, all these cats that wear skinny jeans and wear man purses and shit, you know? It's a fashion thing, right? Well, I hope it is because, I mean, <laughs> if they actually like that, I mean, you know, I'm not into that purse wearing. And, I mean, I'm from a different era, bro. You know, call yeah. me old school. Call me old. Call me not with it. I just don't ride any waves. And, you know, I bring my... No, sorry. <laughs> That'll be in my car at all times. <laughs> yeah, bro. Nah, I'm good, man. You know, I, I just... I never embraced that style, bro, because for one, my fat ass can't even fit into no skinny jeans, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and second, if I carried a man purse, I'd probably have my strap in it, you know, <laughs> so I'm, I'm good, bro, I'm good, and I mean, more power to whoever does, I mean, I just don't get how fools think that sagging skinny jeans and calling it drip, how are you tripping, bro, <laughs> you know, but whatever, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm old school, and I, I'm going to keep it authentic till I'm gone. That's just like my music. My music has not changed. And because I have followers that have been with me for 26 years. And I don't think they would accept me trying to do trap or trying to ride this new West Coast wave that everybody's riding. Nah, man. I keep my shit authentic. It's just, you know, updated West Coast sound. I'm not on that new West Coast shit that they call. Yeah. I'm not, bro. I, I, I'm staying with my the way I do my thing, and if people like it, cool. If they don't, I'm cool too. I don't, I'm not losing any sleep over it. Yeah, I think that's good too because um, artists nowadays that like blew up from like the early 2000s or 2010s, like something like that, get into the rap game. Uh, you can see them like they'll put out albums or projects, trying something new. And because it's not the way that they like had been doing it before, it's a different sound. They get a lot of hate on and it. And it flops. Yeah. And it flops. So, you know, um, I just rather have my fans. Every time I post something new with some new song that I did, they're like, "Man, like always, Shadow dropping that heat the way he always does." I that's better for me than trying something new and failing at it. You feel me? Not that I won't be able to do trap because I, mumble rap. I mean. I mean, what, what the fuck is mumble rap? You just mumble, you know. <laughs> trap. I mean, every we call twist and and I could, I've done trap before features, bro, because that's the beat that that was given to me, and and I told him, hey, if this is what you want me on, I'll rap to country music. I don't care. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like all I need is a is, is a, a tempo, and I'm I'll write it. But as for me coming out with a new project and find trap trap or or new West Coast, nah, it, it ain't gonna happen, bro. I just stay doing what I do, and that's it. That's what's up. That's what's up. Uh, who were some of the artists that you first met up with and made tracks with that you actually uh, produced and put out? Uh, well, that were already in the game or, or just in general? Because just just in general for when you first started making music. Okay, so the first, first person that I did features with was um, Night Out, Little Rob, Little one, people from San Diego. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Um, that's pretty much. I just kept it in the city. I mean, I had the homie OG Sanch, GPA, Slush the Villain, uh, 
which were other cats that were doing music at the time. Uh, I must I might forget a few names, but once my records came out with San Diego music and I started meeting people here and there, then it transpired into me making music with people from, you know, then there were requests for me to do a feature. Like one time, MC Magic flew me out to Phoenix to his house and because uh, he had a badass studio at his house, and I recorded on the last Nasty Boy record, the Nasty Boy Click. I was on their last album that they recorded together, and um, I think it's called Southwest Riders, if I'm not mistaken. And that was one of the first ones I did with somebody that was out of San Diego or California, you know what I mean? So, but then after that, it just started to, you know, get momentum, and I started doing stuff once I started recording it. Because I, once I recorded in San Diego... The, the next and final step is to get to L.A. to the major producers, the major studios, because we didn't have nothing in San Diego regarding music. Back in the day, we had nothing. Everything I, I had to do, once I got signed to a label, I had to come to, to L.A. and record in L.A. studios, work with L.A. producers, which is cool because it, it helped my diversity. You know, it helped me hear different sounds, different, like when I work with, with fingers, when I work with... Uh, who else did I work with? The homie Scorpio, or when I work with the, uh, with the, uh, what's that dude's name? He produced for Kid and Play. Anyways, Soul G. He was actually the one that recorded my first Pit Boston record, and uh, we had him living in a house in El Monte, and and the studio I was recording that was there. So he had East Coast flavor music, but what, he he mixed it with my West Coast sound. And we had Pit Boss in the first Pit Boss and record, but then things happened to where that album and computer got lost, and I had to come to the to the Streetlight Studio to record re-record that album with Floss and Fingers, and that was a total different sound, but it was still new, it was fresh, you know, and and that's when I was recording there, and uh, I believe Roscoe came through. He was vibing off my song, jumped, jumped on a song. Then his brother came through, Corrupt came in. He was like, who's this shit? And then Roscoe told him, that's this fool right here. And and Corrupt felt it, hopped on it, did an outro, intro, a verse, uh, did a hook. I mean, it was just it was just love, bro. But as far as the sound, I had to travel out of San Diego to get, you know, different type of sounds. Yeah. How long did it take to do that album? Which one? Uh, the one you talk about where Ross Boston, yeah, I had to record that album, Floss. Ten days. Ten days. In ten days, how ten many days. tracks was on? Seventeen it? songs. Seventeen songs. Yeah. Mix and master. How did you, and master. How'd you guys? How'd you guys deal with that? I was coming every day. I was coming every day. I think for, okay. for yeah, like, I'm talking about start at ten. We would end at ten or twelve, and um, drop in two to three songs a day. Yeah, from and then scratch. from scratch, I would come in and fingers wouldn't have a beat. Fingers would start start drums, and, and I'd start <laughs> writing to drums, and then he would put piano or talk box. I mean, and, and yeah, so that album is 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 um is special, bro. It was real special. The way it was recorded, the circumstance which we why we recorded it, everything was special about it, and it turned out cool. I mean, that's when when Floss and Fingers were working with Converse, Diamonique, uh seldom seen uh i mean i might forget a few names but homeless yeah homeless nation and these are dope ass artists bro that i've never heard but i kept thinking to myself why haven't they blown up you know i mean i don't know what they're doing i know what dio monique is doing now but as far as everybody else i don't like what happened to that singer there was a badass singer bro this fool should have been diamond already um Kevin. what was his name what was his name? Crook. Crook. That dude, man. He he sang on a hook. Um, a few hooks. He was amazing, bro. Like, he was crazy amazing. I don't know why he didn't blow up, you know, but again, that album had very special special features. And um from I mean, I'm talking from Nancy Fletcher to Corrupt, Roscoe, Crook, Converse, Fingers. Seldom seen. I mean, you name it, bro. I had that that album was packed with good ass features and songs, and um, the whole thing, like I said, is just a special, special circumstance with that whole record. 
So did you guys already have, like, concepts and ideas for the tracks, or did you make them up on the spot? No, everything was made on the spot. Uh, Fingers and uh, what was that other producer? Uh, yeah, he was he was in here with you know he was in the studio with Fingers, and um, they they would work together. But Fingers, for the most part, is the one that came up with the melodies, and then I, I would just it would either hit me and I would come up with the hook, or it would hit me and I would come up with verses and be like, okay, well this is what it is, you know. And, your fingers would add and sprinkle shit around that, and it was just crazy, man. We would sit in a circle and go, "What are we talking about?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it was literally coming down. Like yeah, bro. About earlier when we came up with, well, what, what, what we should talk about in sales, and we came up with sex. Yeah, drugs, sex, drugs, and money. Yeah, yeah exactly. we're talking. What, so, what's selling in the industry right now? Like, what? Well, what are the three topics that everybody's talking about? Well, sex, drugs, and money. That's if you, you know. <laughs> that's what it was, bro. So, you know. um, it was crazy, man. From and then another day we did haters. Yeah. You know all these people talking shit and haters, you know just yapping their mouths. So we came out with haters and that was a dope ass song. Uh, Thug bounce, another dope song. Yeah. Uh, the song with me and corrupt and Roscoe, fucking smash. It was just again the album was just special, bro. It's it's, it's real special. I noticed uh, from interviewing a couple people now uh, that are artists. I noticed that when you guys get in the studio, um, it's not, sometimes you can get a feature on a track that's not supposed to happen. Like somebody just pulls up to the studio a lot and they'll be like down to hop on a track. How often does that happen with you? Well, now, not as much, you know, because not only because of this whole COVID thing. Yeah. I like to be alone in the studio. You know, the less people, the better for me. Um, But before... Before I, I would just be at certain studios where, where where people would pull up, and it might be King Crooked, you know, Crooked Eye. It might be Corrupt Roscoe, you know, and and they're just vibing. And if you know, usually when you know if they're there and, and they're feeling the song, they'll hop on it, bro. You know, mm-hmm. just out of love. And I'm not I'm not around going around paying these people x amount of money, like because I I know people that have paid. Thousands. I'm talking like ten thousand dollars for a feature from Corrupt or from Nate Dog or you know from whatever. And um, I was always fortunate, man, to to have uh, good enough music to where they appreciated it and just blessed me. You feel? Yeah. Me? Yeah. I also noticed that like um, artists when they start making music, it kind of just naturally happens for them to get into the industry to be a part of it when they're making their music just by like putting out tracks and stuff like that. Nowadays, yeah. Nowadays. Because back in the days, like in the early 90s, when, when I was starting out, it, it, it was all footwork. There was no internet. There yeah. was, you know, I mean, there was internet, but it wasn't popping like it is now. Like now with a click of a button, you're around the world. You see what I'm saying? Back then, you had to go to New Mexico. You had to go to, if you didn't have a record deal and you weren't in a DJ pool where they were taking your stuff nationwide, you had to hit every market physically on your own and put it in their face, put it in their ear, and say, like, look, here's here's my shit. This is how I'm coming. Are you a fan or not? Yeah. And that's how I sold 50,000 units out the trunk, you know, when I was 16. I mean, we drove, me and my homeboy Hitman, shout out to my big bro Hitman. We, we took that Cadillac, stuffed the trunk, bro, and went to every city in Cali. And then we went to Arizona, New Mexico, Washington State, uh, Colorado, you name it. We, we we went as far as Texas and all the way back to the West Coast because that's as far as we would go because, I mean, that shit is far. I'm talking days on the road, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, we did, we, we did all right. We would, you know, fill up the trunk with 5,000 units, and then we would have to come home to press another 5,000 units and then hit the road again. So, at the end of the day, we sold 50,000 at $7 a pop. I mean, 350 Gs at 16, I was all right. You yeah. Know? So, <laughs> so, that's what started it all, man, and Again, it's it's nowadays. Yeah, you can you can send records to Empire, Sony, whoever you want. You can look up their names, send it to their email, and you you might just be popping the next day because that's how easy it is now. You know. Yeah. But back then, you really had to have talent. You really had to have talent, and um, a hustle. If you didn't have talent or hustle in you, you were gonna make it. Period. Yeah. 
Obviously, it sounds like you had hustle driving three days to Texas just to oh, yeah. I mean, get your music oh, out. Yeah, bro. We, we had to because, I mean, and it's funny because usually your your hometown's going to be your biggest market, right? Well, my market, my biggest market to this day is L.A. And I'm from San Diego, you know. So um, they just embraced it more than my own hometown, which is crazy because my first song was Till I Die, which talks about being from San Diego, 619, Till I Die. And um, again, though, San Diego is the hater capital of the world. So, you know, that's probably why L.A., put me in the position that I'm in. You know, that's my number one market. It's L.A., San Diego, Phoenix, and then the list goes on. But it's always been that way and, and definitely had to have the hustle in me to get it to L.A. Yeah. And you were, um, you told me that you always kept your, uh, your uh, like, beats the same, your style the same. But I want to know, you have, like, a ton of songs, probably over 100 songs, something oh, like that. Well, I have 26 records, so. Yeah, and then, and then uh, you know, and the some article I read on, online, I'm the most featured West Coast artist, Mexican artist. So uh, there's probably thousands of songs that I have of my own, plus m m countless compilations that I've been on. So, yeah, definitely a lot of work out there on me. Yeah, it sh shows the hustle you have, but I, I'm just wondering, like, how do you come up with all these different concepts in your head to write about or to freestyle I mean, about? Everyday life. Yeah, I've lived these thousands of days, you know. So <laughs> there's there's thing there's there's stuff that I've been through, that I'm going through, or that I'm gonna do, and that's basically what my songs consist of. You know what I mean? So it's it's uh always authentic, always something that I, I've been through, going through, or am gonna put myself in, and that's how I come up with my songs. You know. Which one do you uh, like? Shed light on the most, the, like the present, the past, or the future. Well, my past is what made me. The present is what I am, and the future is what I'm gonna be. So, I would like like to shine light on all of it. You feel me? Because future, I'm not there yet. Present, I'm I'm here. Past, I already did. So, you know, for all the newcomers, all the new people, all the youngsters that, because there's a lot of young cats that might not know who I am or never heard of my work that would listen to my first album till I die. And they're like, oh, shit, this is the dopest shit ever, right? But I'm like, dog, that's from 96, man. Like, I got <laughs> shit that came out last year <laughs> that's way doper. Well, to me, I'm a biggest critic. Like, once I record a song, I like, I have homies, dog. I, I know a lot of people that, record music, and they drive around bumping their own shit all day, right? I'm not that guy, bro. I don't, I don't, once I record a song, it stays in, in the in the, in the the vault till it comes out, and I never listen to it again unless I hear it playing somewhere. I'm not the one to go back and listen to my shit. I'm not the one to go around driving around bumping my shit. That's, that's just not me. Uh, and again, I don't listen to rap, let alone my own rap. Uh, so, yeah, man, it's, it's just, I don't know how people could do that shit, you know, drive around bumping their own shit that they just Yeah. Like I feel like I would I would like start, you know, picking out the little things that's wrong with it and start, you know, thinking about it too much cuz that's does the same for this. I've never rewatched one of the podcasts that I've made just cuz right. it's like I already lived in that moment, you know, I already know what happened. You know what you talked about, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and again, like the only time I I listen to that song one more time is when I'm in the studio and they're either mixing or mastering my song and they're playing it. And I'm listening to what I'm saying just to see if I said anything that I might want to change or if I want to say something a different way. But before, after it comes out and it's final, I won't listen to it. Like, I don't even remember the last time I heard. Well, recently I've had to listen to all my old shit because um, the new distributor I'm with asked me for uh, lyrics to all my songs that I've submitted. Fuck, I'm talking... 26 years of lyrics. I don't have that <laughs> shit anymore. So I had to literally sit down and listen to my songs and retype them and send it to them. So, but besides that, I've, I don't, I don't go back and listen to any of my songs from back in the days. Uh, unless I'm writing something new, that's the only thing I'm listening to. But besides that, I don't listen to none of my music. 
Yeah. Some people might see it like, oh, you're you're stupid or fuck that. <laughs> nah, man, it's just that's just me. Yeah. You know, more power to whoever does it. If somebody likes to listen to themselves over and over, okay, cool. But that's just not me. Yeah. How I want to know because you obviously had great radio success with your song Haters. Yeah. I wanted to know, um, like, how. How that went about, how much popularity that got, and how much times you listened to that song, like, on the radio or anything like that? How many times you well, heard it? there was, yeah, Haters was one of my most played on the radio. Um, and it's crazy because even till I die, my very first song that I recorded, when they first started playing it in Jam Z90 on the station in San Diego, my people would call me, hey, bro, your song's on the radio. And I would turn it on the radio and just, just to see what it would sound like on the radio. And I would hear it, like maybe a, a minute of it. I mean, okay, cool. You know, I'm on the radio. <laughs> but I never, I never, I never really knew, how, you know, how many people or how much it was listened to on the radio. I wouldn't listen to it. It, it started to get to I me. Mean, I just, not too long ago, I found out DJ Who Kid, who has a podcast, I mean, a, a show on, um, Shade four or five was playing my shit. People would send me screenshots. Hey dog, you're on fucking Shade Four or Five. DJ Who kid playing you. Like, oh cool. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> you know, but I don't know. It just I just take shit different, you know? It's crazy. I don't I don't let it get to me. It don't make me any different. I'm still You got that mentality like that's supposed to happen, you know, I'm supposed to be there. Right. I mean, not being cocky or conceited, you know, just like look. I know I don't wait. I don't make whack shit. Yeah, I know I make good music. I mean, one song might not, might not be fit for another dude. Somebody might not like it. They might not relate to it. It doesn't mean the song is whack. It just means that that person didn't relate to it. You see, but as far as me knowing that or thinking like, okay, I got I got I got this whack song out. Like, there's there's people that shouldn't even fucking be in the rap game or, or music game. And period. You know, like they should just fucking something else and they think they're the greatest thing on earth mm -hmm. you know but I mean I think that's just it bro just knowing that your, your, your music's not garbage that a lot of people like it a lot of people fuck with it whenever it comes out most people you know like it and bump it that's satisfactory yeah I don't think it's being cocky I think it's more confidence you know because you know what you put into it you know what you're putting out well and again being in the same room with these multi-platinum artists that give you props, not just because, because they, they hear shit all day, you know, and for them to be in there and, and, and like it enough to to bless you with the feature because they think you're that tight, that's just, you know, confirming that I'm not whack. Yeah. They, they wouldn't have jumped <laughs> on a whack record. You know? That's why they charge the next cat 5, 10 Gs for a verse because they might be whack. Yeah. You know? That might just be a quick five ten thousand $10,000 for them. But as far as that, I mean, I've always been blessed to, to, and again, I'm my biggest critic. I might write a whole song, and once I'm rehearsing it to record it, I might not, I might not like it, and I'll be like, you know what, I'm gonna scratch this. I'm gonna start from scratch again. And I did that a couple of times with Pit Boston, because Pit Boston again was at, a, it was at a certain level, bro, where it was bigger than anything I have, I had done in the past. So. If I didn't feel I came with it, I just scratched it off and started again. That's what's up. Yeah. Um. So, obviously, you still do music now. You're making music still now to this day. Yeah. Um. And I just want to ask you what the the future's looking like with you and your music career. Because earlier, before you were telling us that uh, you used to do work for contracting. Yeah, I used to be. I used to be a superintendent for a general contractor. A lot of people don't know that. You know, uh, I was out of the game for a while. But um, yeah, man, I was I was I was really into I, I liked what I was doing, you know, like I, I actually liked my job, you know. But um, as far as the music game goes, it's it's looking more promising. So I just I just said, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna go full fledged with music again, because I mean, back then I lived off of music for 13 years, you know. So I think now with all the the, the stuff that I have access to, all the people that I know, what I know about the business should put me in a better position than I was back then. And 
I should be more than successful, more than happy with what what I'm able to do now. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, that's it. Yeah, that's sick. So, like, just what are we going to see from you? A couple more more albums, more EPs, features? Yeah, well, definitely. I got, you know, I've, I've been saying this, but again, I've been, you know, going through all the songs on my records, and I'm taking songs out, putting songs in. So I have... An English album coming out all about me, the B-sides. And I have features like Glasses Malone. Um, I mean, of course, I'm going to have, you know, my boy Little One, Night Owl. I have my Spanish record coming out. Uh, there's a label that me and my boy Night Owl started. And that has 18 members right now. So we're going to be putting out 18 projects, including a Mexican regional music artist, uh, Nietzsche Lopez, which is going to just take the Mexican scene by storm, bro. He's like, he's it. He's that dude with the sound, you know, like any on any other big Mexican regional artist. You, you name it, he has it. And um, you'll be hearing him. Uh, so we have the labels called Casa de Locos. And we have a branch of that called CDL Regional, which is... Casa de Locos, but we added regional to it just so it, it wouldn't sound so grimy because Casa de Locos is like, you know, the house of the crazies and shit. So in the Mexican market, that wouldn't really work too well. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't sound too presentable. So we just abbreviated Casa de Locos into CDL and added regional for, you know, for radio, TV purposes. It would sound more presentable. Oh, well, here's, so, here's Nietzsche Lopez with CDL Regional. Instead of Casa de Locos, you know, so <laughs> yeah. so we, we we added a branch to the to the label, and um, late this year and early next year you're gonna hear a lot of shit coming out of there. We have artists in Colombia, in Chile, Guatemala, Mexico, the states, uh, as well as me and Night Out and Little One. We're gonna be putting projects out through this through, through this label, and um, it's definitely gonna be some some good for all of us. So a lot of Latin music coming out in the future for you? Yeah, a lot of a lot of Spanish. Um, I mean, I've always been, you know, the last release I had in Spanish was in 2016. And uh, that album did real good. And people are excited about my new Spanish one. So can't wait to release that. And then I have an album that I'm doing with Night Owl. And I mean, that one is produced by West Coast Stone. And we have features from, I mean, I, I think it's like, 12 or 13 features from major artists from Big Psych, Rest in Peace, Badass, RBX, um, who else? Boss Hog, Sugar Free, Cocaine. Uh, I mean, there's so many. I fucking forgot the rest, dog. But there's like 12 or 13 features on that record, bro. And we're going all out with that record. And um, that's just going to make noise because the sound is... It's crazy. West Coast Stone is a super, super, super dope producer. Shout out to my my bro, West Coast Stone. Um, but yeah, when that record comes out, people are going to be like, what the fuck? Just because of the names that we got on it, bro. Like, it's crazy. That's what's up. That's what's up. I was just wondering if uh, you could recite one of your verses from your favorite songs for us. Maybe we could put it in the intro for our for our podcast. See, from my, one of my favorite I could songs. give you a time to think. I know that's a hard question. From one of my favorite songs. Let me see. No, I got thousands of songs. <laughs> so you got to give me a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, when you do it, what we'll do is we'll add the beat to it and put it in the intro. Plug in the intro. Okay. Uh, let me see. We Probably All About Me. That's my favorite album. Um, let me see. What song can I do from that album? Hopefully I don't forget any words. <laughs> I said, you, you can't compare me to no other. I got the whole world saying he a cold mother. Uh, I said, oh, he a cold mother. Uh, fuck, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> it's called All About Me. It's called Aha. Uh, let me see. I said, what did I say? I said, uh, you can't compare me to no other. I got the whole world singing. He a cold mother. I like. Then we got her culture. 
one time. Hey, to the fans, but to approach them. I'm on fuck with a boy. You're all pitiful. Everything <laughs> coming now sounds identical. Born to conquer, built to hurt. That's the album. The songs are aha. No, that's. You can just rap to it and then we'll, we'll just add the beat. Okay. Be a cold mother. Alarms ring, I bring that. I remember it now. <laughs> I think. Hold on. I'll leave it there, though. Hold on. I said. <laughs> I said, you can't compare me to no other. I got the whole world saying he a cold mother. Alarms ring, I bring the hood culture. One time hate some fans love to approach them. I'm unfuck with a boy, you're raw pitiful. Everything coming out sounds identical. Born to conquer, built to hurt. Cranberry and vodka while I'm chopping a bird. Keep my family first. Keep my, ap- hold on. Keep my family close and my enemies closer. I ratchet in the glove. And one in the holster. I'm known around the world, across the seven seas. MR dot, I shit on my enemies. Expect me, like government taxes. I do it how I do it. I don't know what the max is. Eliminating opposition. Where's the competition? There ain't none. You will never be in my position. Aha. Yes, sir. It is, bro. <laughs> I always trip out on artists that have. I know about personally that have a big catalog. To get up on stage, you gotta do a show. Oh and yeah, no. Dog, when I do, yeah, those are my shows. My shows, the shortest show that I do is thirty minutes, and the next one's forty five, and the next one's an hour fifteen. Because when you headline, they always want you to do the most, right? right? Yeah. So when I when I do those type of shows, bro, I, that's the only time. And you, know, you got to take this into consideration. When I, my show tape, you rehearse it. I rehearse it, but it, it doesn't have the lyrics in it. Right. It only has the dubs, so in and outs. So you have to, so that's the only time that I listen to my shit. Like, because my show tape consists of Till I Die, and then all those 26 years, bro, like I take one or two songs from each album, and, and I do it. So it's, it's crazy. And then after my English set, I do another 25, 30 minutes of Spanish. Damn. So, yeah, dog. So it's crazy. Did you mess up, though? Like, you forget the words? Nah, when I'm in the moment, dog, I don't I don't forget. Because I rehearse it in the hotel. Right. I rehearse it in the hotel on my way to. And even behind the backstage. You know what I'm saying? I got, I got my headphones on. And I'm, I'm like, okay. Because that's the last thing I want to do is fuck up. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, I definitely, you know, to, to that... Me listening to my own shit, and that's the only time I listen <laughs> to my shit is to rehearse it for a show, but not to bump it. So, but yeah, that's crazy, bro. That you know, and it's crazy because once I hear the beat, just like right now, I hear the beat and it just <laughs> it resets my brain and it comes to me like that, you know, like till I die. I don't I don't know the lyrics, but if I hear the beginning to it, it'll come to me. It's it's I don't it's like riding a bike, you know what I'm saying? So, it's by it's, the way, I remember the day. Came in the next morning, sitting on the couch, packing a ball, going, "We gotta redo the track." I'm like, "Dude, no way!" <laughs> like, yeah. It doesn't sound right, but dude, we gotta do like three songs today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, dog. yeah. I mean, it has to be right, you know. And, and and even even then, you know, somebody else might think it, it's it's whack. Again, because they don't, you know, but there, it could be a lot of reasons why people think it's whack. You know, not not just because you're, you're actually whack. It's because they don't like you or what you're doing or they're hating or whatever. Yeah, you know, it it might not be their style. It might be too gangster for them. You know, maybe they want to hear love shit, you know, like brown boy shit, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) (laughs) Nothing against my boy brown boy. That's the homie, but, you know, like his music and mine is different. It's the same genre, but it's different. So, yeah, man, shout out to to everybody in the rap game. It ain't easy. (laughs) (laughs) So where can people... uh find you and look you up in order to find out and uh, see these new uh, projects that you're going to be putting out I in mean, the future. I mean, mainly I use my Instagram page. You know, that's, that's pretty much it, bro. Mr. Shadow 619. You know, Mr. Shadow and the number 619 right after it. Uh, I, I post most of my new work there. I even throw some of my old school stuff just, just for the people that, you know, enjoy the old school shit. Um, but that's it, bro. You know, I mean, I got my Facebook up. I don't, I'm not even on Facebook like a like that, where I'm on it every day. Everything they see shared on my Facebook page is from my Instagram page. 
So, and the reason I do that is because just recently my Facebook got got verified. So I didn't even know I had twenty seven thousand followers on on Facebook. Till you know, the other day my boy told me like, "Hey, bro, you got twenty seven thousand people. You you used to have nothing." I'm like, <laughs> "Fuck, I guess you know." But Instagram is my go to, and um, I think that's the only tool I need. I, although people be like, "Fuck, no, there's this and this and this and that." Again, you know, people go on Instagram and post every day different things. I post maybe once a month. You know, my story, if somebody sh- sends me something with me in it and they tag me, I'll share it on my story. But as far as posts, you'll see, bro, my last post was my Spanish song like a few weeks ago. You know, and and, and I always tell people, like, look, I'm not going to post shit every day. Like, my boy Baby Bash, he posts like five, six new, pay- new fucking <laughs> posts every day. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, whatever, you know, I, I just... Or out here look at Snoop, he posts like 10 times a yeah, day. Yeah, you know, and maybe that, I, I mean, I I don't think you need to do that to stay relevant. If if your followers are authentic and they fuck with you, they're going to fuck with you when you come back on. They don't, they, they're not, they don't have to expect something every day. You feel me? Like, yeah. Plus, I don't have shit to post every fucking <laughs> day. Like, like, what am I going to post? Like, three... Five, ten times a day. What the hell am I going to post? My dog's fucking fighting or... <laughs> I, I don't know, bro. Like, you know, And I'm not the one to go and search on people's shit, search for memes or whatever the fuck. I'm, I'm not that dude, man. I, I'm old school. You know, I'm an old soul, bro. So, And and I, it's crazy because I did a, 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 a video and they posted it on YouTube a long time ago, like in 2014, where I was saying, fuck Instagram, fuck Facebook. I'm never going to have one of those. You know, because I didn't know how much of a tool it was right. for the business, you know, because I think, I thought it was like MySpace. People just fucking going on there being stupid, you know what I'm saying? Trying to find something that you're not even looking for. But when I found out it, it was a marketing tool yeah. and, and people can see you around the world. Like I get messages from Africa, Nigeria, uh, Germany, uh, all Asia. I mean, Crazy ass places that I never even heard of, bro. And, and they're like, "Oh, we bump your shit out here," you know. Yeah. I'm like, "Oh, cool." And I would have never known. <laughs> I would have never known if it wasn't for that, you know. So, you know, I started my Instagram in, in 2016, and um, I mean, I'm not. I don't even have that many followers, bro. I think I have like 50, 50 something thousand. You know, I mean, all these other cats like that that are in the same genre as me have hundreds of thousands of, of followers, but that's because they jumped on it as soon as it started. Right. You know what I'm saying? I would have been there too, but I just barely did my shit in 2016. So, you know, uh, and I don't I don't be buying followers. I don't be buying likes, you know, like to, to get more followers. Fuck all that. That's, that's phony shit. Like, if they're not authentic, I don't want them, you know, and if they don't want to follow me because I don't post every day, then I'll follow me. It doesn't... I don't lose any sleep, believe me. <laughs> yeah, so, and a lot of people tell me, oh, that's that's dumb, bro. You need to fucking post more shit so you stay relevant and you stay in these people's faces and they're, and they're in the palm of their hand and shit. Like, like, bro, I don't really care for that, man. Like, There's some artists, that, big artists that don't even have an Instagram. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's just how you operate. Oh, no, and there's, and there's big artists that have, like, Corrupt, for example. I think he has like fucking seven thousand followers. You don't even publish. I think it's his account. Yeah. I think it's somebody else he set up for, but he doesn't do anything. Yeah, you know. So you don't care. Like, exactly, bro. Like you know, if if and I think, I mean, corrupt so dope, and, and I think he would feel the same way of what I'm saying. Like, if your fans fuck with you, they're gonna fuck with you when you drop something, regardless. Or wherever you go. Yeah, exactly. So. I don't think I have to be posting shit every day to, to stay relevant. I've been relevant for 26 years, nonstop. I've always, only when I got sick, that, that, that time where from 2008 to 2012, when I, was, when I had my first stroke, is when I was really not active, not active at all. Like No music was coming out. I, was, I wasn't doing shit. I was going through marital problems. I was going through custody problems. So... No, nah, I was just more focused on my personal life and, you know, my health. So, but besides that, I don't feel I need to post shit every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's one one thing to take away from this podcast today is if it's not authentic, I don't want it. 
Yeah, exactly, man. Why would you want something that's not real? Yeah. You feel me? That's that's it's not gonna take you anywhere. Nah, it's not. It's just gonna it's gonna you're gonna be in the same place with some fake shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where do you upload your music to? YouTube or uh Apple music or you know what's like funny? That? I don't even have a YouTube channel. Really? I don't. <laughs> and a, a lot of people have been on my ass about that. They've been like, Hey bro, you gotta get your YouTube because that, that's money, your views get you paid, blah blah blah. But again, I don't I don't I don't know, bro. It doesn't, you know. I mean, I know I have to, and eventually I will. And I finally found the person to do it. You know, my boy Nacho. What's up to my boy Nacho? And um, he's the one that, you know, this, this little last post that I did on my Instagram, he went in the studio and was filming me and shit. And he's like, bro, you need to do these, a lot of these, and post them, and pe people want to see you. I'm like, hey, yo, bro. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I know I got to get on my YouTube channel, uh, especially with this new label that we got going so that we can cross-promote shit and whatnot. But... Yeah, yeah, bro. So it'll come eventually. It'll come, and uh, everybody will know. But for the most part, you know, nothing. I don't post anything until it comes out to the market, bro. And just, you know, we post it uh through whatever platform is gonna be released on or whatever distributor, and then they send it off to all the platforms: Spotify, Apple, you know, whatever the hell. But for me to go and upload something somewhere, I, this this not me. <laughs> I just send it to my distributor. They fucking upload it, and they tell me, hey, you're in fucking 150 platforms around the world. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. I'll wait for the check. <laughs> you know, so that's pretty much it, bro. Um, only thing I post is, is again, on my Instagram, I upload songs or videos of whatever I'm doing. Um, that's the only uploading I do, bro. I don't... <laughs> I, don't I don't really have an itch to go and release anything else until I, I mean, once I get YouTube going and I figure that shit out, I'll, I'll, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. But until then, you'll just see it on my Instagram. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Well, uh, those are all the questions I had for you today. Um, I really appreciate you coming through. One of the, you oh, know, thank you for having me. You know, OG trip. Chicano rap members coming, making a movement from San Diego. Yeah. Crazy to, you know, have you here. You knew me before I was, even knew you. I knew you before you even talked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it's a trip to, Crazy. to see you doing this, bro. And, you know, it's good. It's, it's a good feeling to come back. And, uh, you know, your pop's always been good to me. And, um, you know, it's just good to see you doing this for the culture and, and you know, that you're staying out of trouble and uh, <laughs> being a, a good gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's all for it for today. Um Really appreciate you having here. Yeah. Thank you for having me, bro. We'll see, and we'll see you on the next episode. This the podcast, podcast, who the prodigy. This the podcast, podcast, who the prodigy. This the podcast, podcast, who the prodigy. This is my podcast.